Denver, LA, remain standing just for a moment. And uh, I'm going to be speaking today a word of the Lord that um, I pray uh, this is really my lane. Uh, I have a deep passion for people to learn how to connect to God and to worship and uh, to understand the power of how to take your prayers and take them to another level and watch them manifest. Uh, my text is in James, uh, the fifth chapter. And it's a pretty cool passage of scripture. It basically talks about when we come together, if, uh, if you're suffering, we should pray. And that's what I love about our church. We pray. And then if you're, if you're happy, sing. And we like to sing here. And some of you really aren't half bad singers. You're good. And then it says, if you're sick and you haven't been able to break through, let the elders, let, let those in authority pray with you, the prayer of faith. And, uh, and then it says that our prayers are effective. They, they avail much. They make a big difference. And then here's our text. I love it. Elijah, this is a prophet in the Old Testament. We'll learn a tiny bit about him today. Was a human being. Everybody say a human being. That's like, why is that? Well, it's... it's it's, it's God's way of saying, Elijah, this great prophet, was just like you. He was a human being, just like you. Even as we, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain. I think somebody prayed that over Southern California. We got to find him, get that thing reversed. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Today, I'm going to impart something into you. It is a passion and a transferal of an understanding that's going to change the way you pray. It's going to change the way your prayers get answered. I think we're going to make history today. I think in a thousand years from now, when we're in heaven, we'll be looking at each other and you'll be like, because that's how strong I feel this in my heart. I want to talk to you today. Pray like a prophet. Pray like a prophet. Before you're seated, Denver, do the same thing. Look at somebody and say, I'm going to learn how to pray like a prophet. Tell, tell somebody that. I'm going to learn how to pray like a prophet. God bless you. You may be seated. Wow, what a great crowd. It's so fantastic to see you. And as you know, we, we're so honored uh, to be with you. We love you very much. So pray like a prophet. Two things. Uh, first of all, when you talk about prayer, I, I'm, I'm going to be 62 years old in a, couple, in, in a week or so. And... I've been going to church all of my life. When you talk about prayer, you get a lot of mixed feelings about people when you hear about prayer. Because first thing you hear about, oh, yeah, prayer, man, prayer's good. Prayer's right. Man, I need to do more of it. And, you know, people kind of feel guilty because they pretty much feel like, you know, I'm not praying enough. So when you talk about prayer, you, get, you stir up this little bit of discomfort. Well, I'm, I know prayer's good. I need to be able to pray more. And unfortunately, sometimes prayer has come across this as part of a discipline, an obligation, something like, hey, if you're a Christian, you need to pray. And uh, I get that. There's a certain discipline to that. But today, I want to really take that off the table. I don't want you to see prayer as a discipline, as a devotion, as one of the things you do because, well, you're a Christian. I, I want you to see it really differently today. I mean, I believe in the disciplines and, you know, I, I, I admire people that go to the gym and work out and do that. I, I just, I love it. I, I love, you know, these people that are, you know, they wear tight uh, t-shirts and have, you know, these bulging uh, things coming everywhere. And, um, you know, I like it, but not enough to do it because, you know, my philosophy in life is, you know, no pain, no pain. <laughs> it's like, hey, man, I'm... I'm not into that. I've done them. I tried them all. And, you know, quite frankly, after a few times of doing it, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> so I get the ideal of spiritual disciplines and spiritual exercise. So don't, don't get me wrong on that. But I want to tell you something. I need you to see prayer differently today. I need you to see prayer as more of an opportunity. I, I, I need you to see prayer. Here's the analogy I want you to go with me on, a, on, on understanding prayer. Imagine prayer is like... Uh, managing a checking account of somebody very, very wealthy. Do I got you yet? Okay, let me go further. It's your responsibility to manage this checkbook that's got all 
all of this incredible wealth. And let me give you an example. Actually, Bill Gates has put a lot of his money in a trust. And, and, and it's for tax purposes and obviously to help other people. But in order to uh, have that trust, the government requires that you spend 5% of the, of the worth of that trust every year to keep it operating as something that's intended to serve. So he has a whole team of people that are coming up with ways to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, like to get the number of the person that has to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and here's the point. This money has already been designated and now it, it needs to be spent. Listen carefully because what I'm about to say is theologically sound. Prayer is like a checking account that has the wealth and resources of the almighty God. He has placed those resources in a bank account and then given you and I the authority and to get the understanding of how to withdraw from that bank account and activate it on the earth. It's what it means when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God does nothing on the earth but in answer to prayer. And you know what? When we get to heaven, we're going to realize that. And we're going to like kick ourselves in the somewhere. And, and God says he'll actually have to wipe away tears. And listen carefully. I think it's going to be because we're going to realize how much we did not take advantage of the access that we had to God. And how really God has delegated what he wants to do on the earth in people and through people through prayer. So prayer is not just an obligation. It's not something you check off every day that says, uh, oh, got to do my prayer. It's like being at the table of world shakers with all this resource and you get to be in the game. This is very important. This has revolutionized my prayer. I don't feel like I have to pray I get to pray and I recognize much of what God wants to do on the earth is relying on my ability to bring it forth in and on the earth. The other thing I want you to see is you're to pray like a prophet. Now that's a bit intimidating because you're like, well, I'm not a prophet. I'm barely a good Christian. Don't raise your hands. So when I say pray like a prophet, the, the, the first thing is that's a bit intimidating. You're like, well, I got to be real spiritual to pray like a prophet. And, 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 and certainly Elijah was an incredible uh, prophet. He, he was the kind of prophet that could stop. I, I was trying to research for this message today about what it means to stop rain or to create rain. And science can't do it yet, but they're experimenting with literally doing rockets and burst and, 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 and having thousands of rockets burst into a cloud to break up the molecules of the ice and try to create rain. I mean, the dynamic of creating rain is very complicated. And a man could pray and say, stop the rain. That's pretty incredible. Elijah had the ability to, uh, to, to, to see fire come down from heaven. I mean, one time they were having a who's the greatest God uh, talent show. <laughs> so everybody was out there praying to their gods, and everybody was going to see who wins the who's the greatest God talent show. So all of the other people were praying, and and then at the end of the day, Elijah finally got up. And there was, there was a little trick that they used to do back in the days where they'd put kind of wood uh, embers that they would bury. And then when they would act like they're worshiping, they could catch a spark and create a fire and uh, make the people think that they had power. And Elijah knew that. And he had them pour water all over the sacrifice and just gallons and gallons. I love it. You know, sometimes right now, you know, uh, I get a little bothered with the weak need. Um, uh, kind of 
uh, lame mentality of Christians that don't understand. And I'm not being critical, but just don't understand the power that we have. And, and it's like, I think this country ought to give rights to every religion. I'm not threatened by any religion. I say, this is America, and I say, bring it on, you know? And sometimes it appears that Christians are being persecuted and that we're not giving the fair chance. Listen, I don't want a fair chance. As far as I'm concerned, everybody else get a head start. Everybody else get all the rights you want. When you're done, let us pray. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm just saying, pour the water on it. We don't need anybody to hold our hand. Is that all right to say? And that's the way Elijah was. Elijah was like, okay, I'm, and he prayed fire down from heaven. This is an amazing guy. Pray like Elijah? Pray like a prophet? Well, here's the thing real quick. The Bible actually tells us that the prophets, not only are they human like us, but the Bible actually says that what they have isn't worthy to be compared to what we have. It actually says that. In 2 Corinthians, it says, you know Moses, the guy that saw the hand of God write the Ten Commandments? Wow, that's pretty cool. The guy that put down his staff and watched the Red Sea depart? It's like, whoa, that dude, that guy, he's powerful. God says, hey, what you have is so much greater don't even compare yourself to Moses or David or Elijah. That's a PGA golf clap right there. Nice putt, preacher. That's a pretty spectacular statement. So here's what I'm saying, friends. I'm saying to you that prayer is not an obligation. It's not some religious devotion. It's not a discipline that you have. Prayer is how you get access to everything God is. And it's how it gets released in the earth. And God wants you not to pray timidly, but he wants you to pray like a prophet. And this is for real. Because you see, back in the Old Testament, the Bible, there was a little rule about God. God said, I'll do nothing on the earth, but, I'll, but first reveal it to my prophets. So when God was going to do something, he's like, what is God doing? What is God doing on the earth? What is he up to? You'd go find a prophet, and, and the prophet would tell you, then you knew what God was up to because God made a deal. I won't say or do anything on the earth until I tell my prophets. In the New Testament, it's different. Now, sure, there's the office of the prophet, little theology here. You have five-fold ministry. You have pastor, teacher, evangelist. Uh, apostle and prophets. There's the office, but more importantly, there is the gift of prophecy. So rather than God saying, I won't do anything on the earth until I tell the prophet, it is now, I won't do anything on the earth, earth until through the gift of prophecy that I give my people, I'll do everything I do on the earth through that gift. And friend, it's a gift, not a reward. Because some of you are like, oh, I can't do that. I can't pray like a prophet. I don't have that much. I'm not that good. It's not a reward. It's not like you do everything really good all week and say, oh, man. It's like the guy said, I haven't cussed today. I haven't looked at people in the wrong way. I have had my, kept my temper in check. I've really done really well today so far. But in a few moments, I'll be getting out of bed. And God, I'm going to need your help. The gift of prophecy is, is, is a gift. Go to Calvary. See, the, see Jesus? You see the cross? You see the blood? You see that? Now look down, and there, like almost a Christmas, the original Christmas tree. Go with me. There, there. There's gifts. There's actually, the Holy Spirit has nine of them. Gifts. Oh, look, for me? And here's the gifts. And think how cool this is if you really could get ownership of this and you really believe this and you would activate these gifts because the gifts can do everything except open themselves. So I need you to hear them and then I want you to then desire them because they're right here. There's the word of wisdom. There's the word of knowledge. There's the discerning of spirits. There's the gift of tongues. There's the interpretation of tongues. There's prophecy. There's the working of miracles. There's the gift of faith. And there's the gifts of healing. Wow. How many like to have that? You wouldn't even need health insurance. 
Let's go. Let's go do that again. Wait, what, 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 what are you saying? Yeah, yeah. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, I've given everyone gifts uh, as according to my will, and the gifts are the word of wisdom. That means God gives you wisdom without having to go to college. God can give you insight into something that comes supernaturally. Gives you the word of knowledge, which means you know how to apply the wisdom. And then he gives you the discerning the spirit so that you can see through things. You can understand things. You can pick up on things that are not available to the natural eye. You know, the guy takes you out to eat, pays the bill, opens up the car uh, for you. And it's a nice car. And he even pays the bill at McDonald's. And you're thinking, this is the man. This guy could be my dream. But if you have the gift of discernment, something goes, uh, then you find out later that's not his car. He's borrowing it. He's sleeping, he, he, you know, he's sleeping on a couch at his mother's house. He hasn't been able to keep a job. And you're like, thank you. That's discerning of intentions before they are evident. See, that's a gift. The working of miracles. The word miracles actually means the word dunamis, which we get the word dynamite from. So just imagine you that, open that gift up. Oh, look for me, the gift of miracles. You open up, it's dynamite. How cool. You're walking around, you're in the job, there's a lot of politics. You haven't been getting the promotion that you deserve because somebody else has been out hustling, out politicking you, and you just feel there's barriers in your way. You know what you do, man? You just, No, uh, I know it sounds funny, but that's what miracles do. They break things open that would take time and maybe never without that gift. There's the gift of faith. Sometimes you don't have faith. I, I just don't have faith. If you can believe that you could, if you believe this can happen, I, 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 I do believe, but Help my unbelief. God says, no problem. Go over here. See that? Gift. What? Gift of faith. You mean I can have the faith to move mountains and not be mine? It would be a gift? Are you, am I selling you on this? Are you bored? No. no this, can you imagine living your life like this? Gifts of healing, emotional, all of These are all your gifts that God has given to you. But even better than that, after 1 Corinthians 12, then he goes into 1 Corinthians 13. You know that one, right? That's the, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I have become like sounding brass. And I mean, we have this on our computer screensaver. There's plaques of this. People read that scripture at their weddings and they're not even Christians. It's like the most poetic. It's like the whole Bible in 13 verses. Right? And it ends, you know, love endures all things, hopeth all things, believeth all things. Without love you are nothing. Now abide these three things. Hope, faith, love. And the greatest of these is love. Drop the mic. Dude, this is going to be on a plaque. This is, this is so, this is fantastic. Paul, what are you doing? No, 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 Paul, don't write, don't write. Paul, stop, stop. You just, you nailed it. Stop. No, he's not done. I'm going to keep writing. <gasps> Start a second book. No, 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 I'm not done. Whatever you're about to say now, Paul, it better mean something. And here's what he writes. Pursue love but covet to prophesy. Wow. Even the word covet is like, is that legal? <laughs> Listen to me, friends. God wants you to covet to prophesy. And I'm going to explain to you why. Because prophecy is this unction. Prophecy is this gift that is going to transfer things that have been waiting. you got dry bones in your life. The prayers are dead. They're as if they're gone. You have praise, pray, prayers. You have fasted and prayed. You have bound and you have loosed and they are dead, dry bones. You have left them. And I've come here to tell you today that dry bones will dance today because you're about to go back to prayers that you thought were gone, that you thought had no life, 
that you thought God never wanted you to have them. And you're going to pray like a prophet before. I'm getting loud. <laughs> because actually, when you prophesy, all the other gifts are engaged. That's why Paul said, if you're going to do anything, prophesy. Because when you prophesy, it's a word of wisdom. When you prophesy, it's a word of knowledge. When you prophesy, it's a gift of discernment. Prophecy gives you the ability to see through things and see things through. It's the working of a miracle because when you prophesy, boom, it's the gift of faith because you prophesy according to the proportion of your faith. It's tongues because tongues actually stir up the gift of prophecy and interpretation is basically prophecy. Healing and faith, the working of all of it, when you prophesy, you're actually engaging all Nine gifts. Prophecy is how God releases to you and through you. Now, there are three levels of prayers. And these three levels of prayers are the process of God getting through to earth what he desires and what you desire. The first level of prayer we'll call Petition prayers. Petition prayers. Denver, are you with me? Thank you. I, I hadn't heard you say amen for a while. <laughs> I love Denver. We preach there several times, and I love uh, our, our, our church family in Denver. So the first level of prayer is petition. And basically what this means is get, off, get it off your chest. Make everything known. Uh, be honest with God. Cast your cares upon him. And this is a great time of prayer. It's one of the most honorable things. You know, the greatest respect any human can give you is to listen to you. And you know, God gives us all dignity because he has, he gives us the dignity of listening. Always pray like God is listening because he is. Ooh, that's a Twitter line right there. At Phil Muncy. No, Jason. <laughs> Always pray like God. And, 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 and these are prayers that are like this. Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm so lonely. Oh, God, I ache in my heart. Oh, God, I'm so frustrated with my spouse. Not me. I'm just... <laughs> Oh, God, I don't feel like my life is going anywhere. Oh, God, I feel like I'm always sick. There's always something wrong. Oh, and God listens. And God cares. And God actually says he's touched with the feelings. I mean, God's not like, oh, come on, get over your feelings. No, God is touched. Feelings. No, no, you didn't like that, all right. <laughs> but listen, here's my point. God listens, and the Bible says he's touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And that feels so good. Oh, God, I feel so much better. Wow. Wow, does that feel good. Thanks, God, for hearing me out. Whew. Don't stop. You're liable to get up at that point and say, oh, boy, that was good. Don't stop. No, 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 no. Because you need to take your prayer to the next level. The next level from petition is to praise. Because though God is moved by your needs, he acts according to your faith. Oh, let's do that again. God is moved by your pain. He kicks in action by your faith. So though you might feel better about casting your cares upon the Lord, there's been nothing that has changed yet except that you feel relief. Now, instead of saying, God, this job, it's not enough. Look at my boy. 
The shoes got holes in them. I'm, my tires are flat on my car, are, are bald. I'm, God, I can't make the rent. This job isn't enough. I don't know if I can keep doing this. What you got to do now is you got to kick it into praise. Instead of saying, God, I need a new job. I need another. Now you got to engage faith. And here's how you do it. Father, thank you for a better job. Thank you that I'm not going to be stuck in this place by this time next year. Thank you, Lord. You see, you can't keep saying, God, give me another job. Give me another job. God, give me a breakthrough in my career. You're going to talk your way out of it. You got to praise him. Praise your father. By this time next year, that script will be in the right hand. By this time next year, that bill will be paid. You praise him. You praise him. You praise him. But don't stop there. You go from petition needs praise to prophesy. <laughs> and don't you just prophesy. Prophesy like a prophet. Prophesy like a prophet that when he says it's going to rain and the servant goes out there and comes back and says, there ain't nothing out there. That's what a prophet does. Yes. Oh, yeah? Go again. <laughs> See, when you prophesy, nothing doesn't intimidate you. No, 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 you didn't hear what I said. You thought I said nothing intimidates you. No, nothing doesn't intimidate you. Ain't nothing happening. Not intimidated. There ain't no cloud. Don't bother me. <laughs> Go again. See, when you praise, you get a little tired of praising. After a while, I praise you for a better job, better job. And you go every day, every day, every month, every month. But when you prophesy... See, the Bible says that Elijah was to prophesy over those dry bones. He said, look out on the field. He said, look at those bones. They're dry. Not just dry. They're very dry. And Elijah said, what are we going to do with all these dreams? What are we going to do with all these unanswered prayers? What are we going to do? Bounce, bounce, dribble, 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 dribble. God, what are you going to do? Let me tell you what's going to happen, Elijah. You're going to prophesy over those dry bones. Let me ask you something, Elijah. Do you believe that those dry bones can live again? Oh, yes, Lord. Thou knowest. You know, Lord. Oh, no, you don't. I'm not doing nothing. You're making the three-point play. You are going to prophesy over those dead, dry bones. And Elijah, think about it, hear me, because I'm just trying to encourage you. Think about the first thing that comes out of your mouth. You're looking at millions of bones scattered all over the place. And here it comes. Yay, I say, because they spoke 16th century English back in those days. <laughs> oh, never mind. I'm just trying to have fun. I say to all of you dry bones, you shall live again. I hope nobody's listening because this feels really foolish. Do it again, Elijah. I prophesy. I know my son says he's not coming back to the Lord. I know that they have told me to give up on the dream because I'm too old. I know that I've made so many mistakes that my destiny is probably is gone forever. Can I tell you, your destiny is going nowhere without you. And if it looks like dry bones, I'm just asking you to step it up today and pray like a prophet. <laughs> and you step into that third area of the prophetic 
And now you must understand just uh, 90 seconds of theology and then I'm going to release some words that the Lord gave me on the way to church today. Now I want you to understand that prophesying is not just the blab it and grab it thing. See, there, there's a thing called the Word of Faith movement. Thank God the church was literally dying. Uh, dying. And that revelation brought life back to the church. But then people went from confession to... And then they made fun of it, blab it and grab it. And, let, let me just tell you something. This is not that. This is not taking a Bible verse and then blabbing it until you can grab it. No, no, that's another thing. And I don't mock that. I think that has some great power. No, no, no. The prophetic doesn't take something out of thin air and create it through the law of attraction. The prophetic finds where God is at work and then agrees with it. And you know I've told the story about my daughter-in-law. She's a professor of exploratory music at the University of California, San Diego. And in her concert, she plays the trumpet. She slides underneath the piano that's well mic'd. She hits a B note on the trumpet. And it takes three or four seconds until it's a perfect pitch. When she hits that B note on her trumpet and the vibration hits the grand piano that's mic'd, that sound from her trumpet wave will find the exact note on the piano and start vibrating with no one touching it. That is what I'm talking about. God has a sound. He's ready to do certain things at certain times. You pray the right prayer at the right time. You praise God for the right thing at the right time. You prophesy for the right thing at the right time and you can shut the heavens my friend. Pray like a prophet. This is where you discern. This is where you learn that God is at work and you listen and you pay attention and you do. See, Jesus did this. They came to him and said, Jesus, Lazarus, your friend is dying. The Bible says he waited four days. After four days, he takes the journey and when he gets there, they tell him, too late, he's already dead. He tells his disciples, I go to awake him. They said, oh, he's sleeping. When they get there, they find out he ain't sleeping, he's dead. But Jesus is not panicking. Because why? He did the three things I'm asking you to learn to do. When they removed the stone, he stood in front of the grave and he said out loud, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But for, for the sake of the people, I'm saying what I'm saying out loud. And then he looked into that grave that by this time stinketh. And he said, Lazarus. He did the three things. Pray, petition, Father, you heard me. We talked about this four days ago. Now I thank you in advance that you have heard me. How silly is him? How silly is that? Oh, thank you, Lord. This guy is out of his mind. Pooh, whoo, he stinks. Been dead for four days. I prayed, I worshiped, and now he puts his mouth and matches it to his heart, finds the wavelength of God's prophetic sound, and good thing he said Lazarus because we would have had us a terrible thing. Lazarus! That was prophesying. He wasn't praying. He'd done praying. He wasn't praising. He's done praising. See, this is how you got saved. You see... You can't get saved any time you want. No, no, no. The Bible says no man comes to, the, to God but by the Spirit. When I make an altar call in a few minutes, if you feel the Holy Spirit, jump on it. Because no man comes to the Father unless he's drawn by the Spirit. 
So the first thing you have to have is, is you've got to be moved on by the Holy Spirit. Just like the Bible says that the Bible was written by holy men who didn't just write. They wrote as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. And you're in church and somebody preaches the gospel and you feel moved. Respond. And then prophesy because here's what you did. Listen. This is brilliant. Romans 10. Do not say who will call God down from heaven to help me. And do not say who is it will go down to hell and to cause Jesus to rise from the dead. No, I say don't look to me or anyone else for that. I say the word is nigh unto you. In fact, it's in your mouth. And if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart what God said he would do 2,000 years ago will manifest prophetically in that moment. Are you getting what I'm saying? God has said things 2,000 years ago and they're nothing but dry bones to some of us. But when we say yes, God says amen. When we say yes, God says amen. Prophesy, pray like a prophet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your presence that's here. I thank you for your presence that's here right now. I thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. And Father, so many are afraid of these things, and rightfully so. Look at me. I'm praying, but I want you to keep your eyes on me because I, I got a word for you. I know this stuff can get weird, you know. Pentecostals and Charismatics were the only ones that believed this for a long time in this country. As a result of that, we became isolated and protective. And we got a little weird, actually. Because we had nobody to bounce things off of, and we were just kind of weird. How many know those people that are so spiritual they're weird? <laughs> if you don't know that person... I'm, I'm, never mind. <laughs> this is not weird. What's weird is the God that made you, designed you, gave you an eternal destiny, and then leaves you squandering in life like an orphan with no power, no supernatural ability, just pushed around as if all you got is a ticket to heaven and you live like everybody else when supposedly the God of the universe is inside of you. No, that's what's weird. Don't let the mystery of the things of the spirit freak you out. The fact of the matter is you are very comfortable in spiritual environments. A lot of you are, are flirting with and oft, often are involved in spiritual activity. Because in fact you are spirit. And whether it's watching a horror flick that frightens you, it's a spiritual experience and you crave it. Somebody said to me recently, said, man, I want to hunger after God. You don't have to pray, God, I want to hunger after you. You hunger after God, every one of you. You have just divided that hunger in so many different paths. That's all. And once you start eliminating all of the superficial stuff in your life, the craving will find focus. Because this is where you came from. This is where you came from. You are your best you when you are touching things spiritual and the spiritual things are touching you. And God is a spirit and you are a spirit and the best you is when you figure out how to break through all the barriers and be in the press essence of God. It's a little risky. It's awkward, but not impossible. And certainly it's exactly what you need. Worshiping and touching these supernatural things. It's, it's kind of like sleeping. Remember we talked about that? Sleeping is kind of weird, right? Watch somebody go on to sleep, you know, you just kind of watch them, they just kind of like space out like... <sighs> so I go, oh! Watch. When that person is going to sleep, they're shutting down. And another part of them is awakening. Babies can only grow when they're sleeping but you got to shut down something in order for the other to be released. That's what worship does. When you worship, you get out of this material five-sense box 
and start tapping in to what you will be forever. This eternal spiritual. And it's, it comes by sensitivity. You, you got to be sensitive to it. It's, it, it's you know, it's, it's like those sensor things in bathrooms. You know, you know the, the faucet? It's like... Trying to get in touch with the washing, with the faucet here. I was at an airport one time, I was doing that, and I was so frustrated. I was doing everything but a war dance. I mean, I was doing everything. Just Some guy walked in over and turned the faucet on. <laughs> Sometimes worship can feel that way. You just copy everybody. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Nothing. <laughs> to worship you, I live. If I wave my hand a little bit. To worship you. I live, I live to worship you. I ain't getting nothing out of this. What are these people doing? Oh, oh, oh. oh. What's, what's happening? Oh, it feels like I've been here before. What is this? See, Revelation 19 says, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, when you worship, the gifts of the spirit are stirred. Covet to prophesy. And when you do, you stumble, you fumble, you fail, you sometimes look foolish. Go out there and see the cloud. Ain't no cloud, dude. Do it again. Because God wants you to pray like a prophet. And when you worship God, the test of that worship will stand steadfast as the spirit of prophecy is released. And that's how you solve your marriage crises, and that's how you get healed of cancer. And that's how you break that addiction that you've been through so many rehabs that they laugh at you when they see you coming again. This is how you break depression. You worship. And you wait for the weight. And you, you probably say it. You probably say it. Until you can probably see it. And then you probably seize it and then you don't let go of it. And you keep looking for that cloud of the size of a man's hand because prophecy will not fail you, friend. Oh, I feel his presence. On the way here today, I've got just two minutes. On the way here, the Lord said, there's a Rahab here. She or them, it doesn't necessarily need to be male or female as far as the problem. The problem is, is that you have a bad reputation. You have done very many bad things. And the word on the street about you is that you're a womanizer. The word on the street for you is that you are an easy target of abuse and you feel shamed by that and you feel second class and you come here but when you go home you know I'm not as good as these other people I'm talking to you too Denver 
and, and, and you feel, and the Lord said to me, I was driving here, he said, I'm not for what happened to you, and I'm not, I'm, heart, I'm heartbroken because of what your reputation and the lifestyle you've lived, but I want to tell you, the Lord said to me, I know where you're at, and I'm going to find you, and guess what? I'm going to use you. I'm actually going to use you. I've got two, I got two warriors, Joshua and Caleb. I've got some people that need to get access to what you have access to. And I'm actually going to use you. And I'll, I'm going to put you in the lineage of Jesus. And I'm going to get you out of this mess. But I'm coming right where you are. Rahab, where are you? Are you in Denver? Are you here? God is saying, you're not disqualified. He's coming to you. And he's going to take the mess you're in. And he's going to invade that mess. And through the prophetic word, shift not only you, but the environment you're in. And you will have seen that God made good out of your bad. I'm speaking to a Barnabas today. The Lord said, there's a Barnabas here. Is it here? Is it over here? Is it Denver? Barnabas did three things. The first thing Barnabas did is that he financed the kingdom. Somehow he had money. And when the kingdom needed to be funded, God gave him the money. And Barnabas was able to buy land and do things with it. There are some of those of you that are out here. God's given you a spirit of giving. And, and, and in fact, if you don't activate that spirit of giving, you're actually going to dry up the sources that God has given you. And I'm saying to you prophetically, it's time for you to recognize that that money is not for you to store and put in storage. That money is to be seed because there's a lot more for where that's coming from. Where are you, Barnabas? Uh, 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 Barnabas, Barnabas was a friend to failures. When John Mark got kicked out by Paul, John, Barnabas said, I'll take him. Yeah, but he failed. He's a, he's a wimp. He, he, Barnabas said, I'll take him. Who's the Barnabas here today that says, I'll mentor the weak? I'll cover those that have fallen. There's a Barnabas here. The prophetic voice of the Lord says, I'm going to anoint you. And the last thing that Barnabas did was when the Apostle Paul, who was once a very bad person, the first terrorist of the Christian faith, when God converted him, God told Barnabas, get rid of your title because you're about to give your title and your equity over to this man. Barnabas was able to manage his ego in such a way that the Bible starts out Barnabas and Paul and then a few chapters later it's Paul and Barnabas and then it's just Paul. Barnabas was just to be there. The Lord says that there are people in the business world, in the entertainment world and in the educational realm that, that, that have been enemies of the faith and God is actually going to cause you to befriend them. And you're actually going to be looked upon skeptical and with concern. But God is actually pulling you into the world of the Rahabs and the world of the Sauls of Tarsus. And God is going to use you as that bridge to connect that who is the Barnabas. And one last thing God said to me, and these are the most unusual prophetic words I've gotten. This is the last one. God says, there's a Samson. There's a Samson. Maybe it's there in Denver. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's many. But God said there are Samsons who had a calling on their life and, 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 and sought an occasion against the enemy. Because that's what the Bible says. God put it in Samson's heart to go after Delilah because he was setting up an occasion against the enemy. But he fell. He took the bait. God has put some of you in influential roles in movies. He's put you in influential roles for a purpose, to set up a, a stronghold for the faith. But you took the bait, and you got the haircut, and now your eyes are poked out, and you're in the grinding mill thinking it's all over. I sold out, and God said to tell you, Samson, you find you the lad, for God will take and bring a lad to you and you will grab a hold of somebody that is of the next generation and you will be saying in essence don't do what I did but together God has called me to help you and you are going to have one more big influential shakedown for this generation and 
Samson did more in the last feat than he had done all combined. Where are you, Samson? You're without a vision, but your hair is growing back. And God says prophetically, I will bring you back to your calling. Would you get your hands like this? Zero, eight seconds. <laughs> but you have been such good listeners. Now look at me. I'm going to ask the Lord to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. This will just take about 90 seconds. If you want the Holy Spirit baptism, I'm going to pray a prayer. And God is going to release that. Now, if you don't know the Lord, in a moment I'll pray a prayer for that. But if you know the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you need to seek for. And that's where the gifts come from. And it's manifested by being able to pray in that heavenly language, see, because then that gives you the ability to discern and to get access to the gifts. So I'm going to pray that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and that you will be able to pray a few words in a language you don't understand. And that will be the seal that allows you to know that you have been baptized into the Holy Spirit. And if you want that, don't be afraid. There's a protection of safety here. Nothing's going to happen that's weird. Whatever happens is going to be of God. I'm going to pray a prayer. When I do, I'm going to pray. And sometimes apostles had to go into certain churches and certain cities and the Holy Spirit was, was blocked and they weren't able to get access to the baptism and the apostles would speak and the people would get the freedom that they normally were not getting. That will happen to you. When I release that freedom, I'm going to ask you, whether it's for the first time or you need a renewal, I'm going to ask you to say the word hallelujah and I want you to feel it from here. Don't be loud, but you have to say it out loud. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to say it in a way that makes it come from here, not from up here. Not hallelujah. No. Ha. Ah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just say that three or four times. At that point, the Holy Spirit will just come upon you and you will actually begin to speak a heavenly word. And when you do, smile and enjoy it. That is going to open you up to the beautiful world of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it happens to you, keep it right here. Tongues are not for other people so much to hear. So I don't want you to whisper it, but keep it right here. Don't, don't go out here with it. Keep it right here. And this is going to come upon you. Are you ready? Get your hands out like this and you're ready. Father, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're really trying to do this by our own self. And we need the Holy Spirit so that the gifts of the Spirit can be engaged in our so by the authority given to me right now, I release the freedom of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive now the gift of the Holy Spirit. Say it. Hallelujah. Yeah, there you go. Come on. Three or four times. deep breath. Oh, this is going to be so liberating for you. This is going to change everything for you. Now look at me for a moment. Put your hands down. Did anybody get a witness of the Holy Spirit? Let me see your hand. If something happened to you, you felt the witness of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. All right, I always do this twice because the first time I do it, people are like, what is he going to do? Now you know what's going to happen, right? So I'm going to do it again. And when I do it again, the minute I say receive the Holy Spirit, then if you want the Holy Spirit baptism or you need to be renewed because it's been a while, then immediately say, have your hands open, and uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, three or four times, get it out. And then let the Holy Spirit take over from there, and then we're going to move on. But you cannot do what I talked about today on your own. You need this. Don't be afraid. This is beautiful. This is for all of you. Are you ready? You can get your hands out again if you'd like. If not, keep them down because it's going to happen. <laughs>
Father, by the authority given to me as a servant of God, I've come here today to loosen the environment, to loosen the atmosphere, and to release the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And so right now, by that authority and by that anointing, I speak now, be filled with the Holy Spirit now. Come in for a few more seconds. Come on. Some of you are right there. Just speak. I don't want to manipulate anything. But you're right there. Just hallelujah. 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 Oh, how I cherish the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How I cherish the gift of the Holy Spirit. How I thank you that this gift is mine. This baptism is mine. And the ability to pray in the Spirit is my right. And Lord, I thank you for it today. Can I get everybody just to lift your hands up high and just give God praise any way you're comfortable. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, Denver. Come on. Come on. Let's stand to our feet. Come on, Denver. Come on, Denver, stand to your feet. Everybody, look at Denver, lift your hands. The Holy Spirit is filling this house. Come on, somebody ought to give the Lord a shout of praise. Woo! Be filled. Be filled. Pray like a prophet. Pray like a prophet. Now, one last prayer and then something unique is going to be released. But Father, those that are here today, and I just want to ask you this question. If, if you were to die in the next few hours and you will die one day and you were to face Almighty God, would you be at peace? Because you will face Almighty God. Are you at peace? If not... I would like to pray a prayer with you. The good news is that God has already forgiven you. He loves you. All you need to do is receive the free gift of eternal life. You say, oh, I'll do it at another time, not now. I, I, I'm not ready. Look, if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel the Holy Spirit, that's the time to come. Now is the day of salvation when the Holy Spirit is bidding you this is your day. You say, well, I don't want to embarrass myself in front. You're not going to have to do anything but raise your hands. But that raising of your hands is saying, I'm ready to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And if you'll do that today, behold, old things will pass away and all things will be new. And if you say, Phil, I want to accept Christ as my Savior, or I'm so far from the Lord, my heart is grown cold towards the Lord. I want a fresh new start. If that's you, Denver, LA, no shame, lift your hand up high right now and I'm going to pray a prayer with you. I want to be right with God all over the building. There, Denver, what about you? Are you right with God? Are you at peace? Is your heart cold and you need a new beginning? Beautiful. Many, many hands. Everyone pray this prayer with me together with our friends. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. By believing that in my heart and confessing with my mouth, I make you Lord and Savior from this day forward. I now receive the free gift of eternal life. Come on, the angels are shouting. Come on, Denver. Come on, L.A. Let's join the angels over the many, the many.